book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. <coughs> I had a, there's a thought here that, on my heart tonight that, well, it's one of those that, well, I don't really know how long to tell you it's been there. Seems like probably a year or more, and uh, hopefully it won't take me that long to share it with you. And, uh, uh, but uh, I feel like that there's something here for us tonight that uh, we, each one of us, can receive from the Lord this evening. And so turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 8, and uh, I'd like to read the first 12 verses of Ezekiel chapter 8. Amen. Follow along closely, read along with me as we look at these verses of Scripture tonight. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north. There was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the Lord God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of clean things, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel, portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then, now notice verse number 12. This is our main text tonight, verse number 12. Then said he unto me, Son of man, Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. This is the beginning of a series of things that was written by the prophet Ezekiel. And we will touch briefly on even some other chapters that follow Ezekiel chapter 8. Some things that are taking place here, and we're going to get more involved, but let me just touch on some things as we were reading that I should probably point out to you just so that they'll be clarified. We see here, like in verse number 5, he talks about an image of jealousy in the entry of the tabernacle. The people of Israel had come to such a state of idolatry in their in the land that they had actually brought idols into the temple of God. And they had set them up alongside of the Ark of the Covenant, which was, of course, symbolic of the presence of God. 
And God was beginning to look and beginning to deal with the heart of Ezekiel as to what to say. Now, our text tonight, as I mentioned, is going to come from verse number 12, where the Lord said to Ezekiel, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. Sometime back, just reading this passage of scripture, these words caught my attention. The chambers of imagery. The chambers of imagery. And I want to talk about this, these chambers of imagery tonight. And it is not as far removed from each and every one of our lives as maybe we would think. First of all, I want us to note something. These chambers of imagery refer to a world within our hearts. A world within our hearts. Within each and every one of us tonight, there is an immaterial world. We're familiar with the material world, aren't we? We live in it every day. It's full of houses. It's full of businesses. It's full of jobs. It's full of, of families. It's full of homes. It's full of, of all of the things that we see and we, we participate in in this life. But there is a world, a world that is an immaterial world that is, now listen, it is not unrelated to the material world. It is not unrelated to the material world. You say, what is this immaterial world that you're referring to? It is a world that is full of thought. It is a world that is feel, filled with feeling. It is a world that is filled with aspiration. It is a world that is filled with memory. A world that is filled with conscience. All of these things make up, and other things as well, that would be along those lines. But these things make up an immaterial world that each and every one of us, I don't care what your uh, name or age is tonight, you have an immaterial world that dwells within your life. Amen. Many people would call it the imagination. The scripture calls it the chambers of imagery. The chambers of Im imagery. <coughs> This immaterial world is a realm. I want you to hear me tonight. It is a realm of absolute sincerity. The things that take place in the imagination. The things that take place within the heart. The things that take place within the chambers of imagery. Are absolutely sincere. And here's what's troubling. There is nothing that stands in the way of your desires in this immaterial world. Nothing. And so it's something that should be handled cautiously. It's something that should be handled prayerfully. The imagination, the mind, the heart, the soul of the man, the chambers of imagery... And from these chambers, from the chambers that you have within your heart and your soul tonight, from this immaterial world, as I have called it, within each and every one of you tonight, is the source of the godly or the ghastly? Are you with me? From this immaterial world of feeling, from this immaterial world 
of aspirations, from this immaterial world of desire, from this immaterial world of thought and emotion and conscience, from this chamber of imagery, there come forth deeds, there come forth Things. It is the source, it is the fountainhead of things that are godly and things that are ghastly. The potential for good is there, and yet the potential for evil is just as real. It is just as powerful within the chambers of your imagination and your heart. Let's take it into the life of these people and the story of Ezekiel and then maybe and bring it into our lives. We've introduced you tonight to a world within us. But the leader, leaders of Israel, these that Ezekiel was looking at, these 70, he came, he was brought to the, uh, a hole in the wall and, and, and the Lord said, I want you to dig into the hole. And so Ezekiel dug into the hole and he broke through the wall and he entered into a room. And inside this room, the leaders of Israel, there were 70 men, there were 70 people in there, they were the leaders of Israel. Maybe they were national leaders. Maybe they were spiritual leaders. That, that's not really a, a matter of concern. They were the leaders of Israel. And upon the walls, there were all types of idolatry. There were pictures upon the walls that go back into the days of Egypt and the idol worship and the idolatry that took place in the land of Egypt. But we got to note something here about this. This scene, these men were the leaders of Israel that practiced an external religion. They conformed to the religion of the Jews. They conformed to the Judaism. They conformed to the sacrifices. They conformed to uh, all of the functions of the, of the tabernacle. They abide by those things. And yet the Lord is showing Ezekiel that in their hearts, in the exterior, they may worship, say they worship God. But within their hearts, you see them in the dark chamber of imagination as they are worshiping, as they are bowing themselves before idols, as they are bowing. You can read on uh, the balance of chapter 8. It goes on and talks about some of their idolatrous worship uh, with, with uh, branches and leaves and, and uh, their idolatry that was that is going on within this room and it's just simply showing God showing Ezekiel that though these men externally may look like they're worshiping and serving God inside their hearts they're full of idolatry chambers of imagery chambers of imagery <coughs> there's no doubt in my mind that in the book of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 17 through 20, this is what Jesus was talking about. Chambers of imagery, a world within. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew, chapter 15, starting at verse number 17. <coughs> Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drop. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. And they defile the man. Listen to this. Could I read that scripture one more time and change a word? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the chambers of imagery. They come forth from the heart. And they defile the man. Verse number 19. For out of the heart proceed, listen, evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, these are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. These Pharisees, they, it's, not, it's not that they just, they would not, it's not, Jesus is not advocating, for all the children here, he's not advocating that you don't wash your hands before you eat. 
Jesus is telling them that the, because the Pharisees had written it into the law that you had to wash your hands seven times before you could eat. And Jesus is telling them, this is not what defiles you. Because you wash your hands once, twice, or seven times, that is not what defiles a man. But Jesus says what defiles a man is what comes out of those secret chambers of the heart. What defiles a man or a woman is what comes out of those chambers of imagery, those chambers of imagination, that world within us. That is what defiles a man. You see, he says that evil thoughts and murder and adultery and fornication and theft or false witness or blasphemy, these things start deep within the heart, from within a world that, was, that is within our being. A world of imagination, a world of desire, a world of thought, a world of aspiration, a world where there is no obstacles, a world where there, a world where there is nothing that stands between me and my desires. What you are, hear me tonight, what you are in the world within is what you really are. The scripture says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Jesus didn't say, as a man doeth with his life, so is he. No, he doesn't say that. As a man giveth with his wallet, so is he. He doesn't say that. He says, as a man thinketh in his heart. A world within that is full of thought. A world within that is full of memory. A world that within that is full of feeling. A world within that is full of aspiration and desire. From there, that's the source. That's where our life is driven. That's where our life is changed. That's where our life is directed. From deep within a world. Within each and every one of our hearts tonight. You are the sum total of your thoughts and your desires and your ambitions and your feelings and your motives. That's what you are tonight. These people had man fooled, didn't they? These leaders had the people thinking, oh, there are our spiritual leaders. But inside of their hearts, they were not spiritual leaders. They hated God. They were idolaters. They were worshiping the gods of Egypt. They were worshiping the gods of the past. They were worshiping gods. They could not answer them. Their hearts were full of idolatry. They weren't spiritual leaders. Because from their heart, they were full of wickedness. In verse number 12, it says this. Hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? In the darkest recesses of your soul, in the darkest recesses of your heart, that world within you, you dream, you imagine, you desire. And if we dwell upon those desires, you see, let me put it to you this way. A great preacher or a great missionary, it starts with a world of desire. It starts with an imagination. That's why I think that God loves to deal with children about the ministry. Why? Because they can imagine themselves. They can imagine themselves forging through the brush. 
they can imagine themselves breaking into uncharted territory, dealing as a missionary. They can, they can picture themselves before a congregation of people preaching. They can sense in their imagination, they can sense the anointing of the Holy Ghost that would rest upon them as they would preach under the power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They can imagine people being saved. They can imagine an altar that is filled with those hearts that are hungry seeking God. That's where a ministry has begun. In a heart that is willing to imagine what God can do. And yet out of the same heart, isn't that where a murder is done? In an imagination, a desire to do something that is evil. The feeling. The plans, the scheming, the desiring. The destruction, it's all there within a world, within our hearts. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He says, what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery. Every man, each and every one of us, you, And I have a chamber of imagination within our hearts that is, can I call it the rudder, that directs our life in the way that we're going to go. It's the rudder that leads us in the path that we're going to follow. You say, but I'm in church. That doesn't matter if you're in church. But I conform to what the Word of God has to say. That's not really what we're talking about. I'm talking about the condition of our heart. I'm talking about our imagination. I'm talking about our desires. Do they conform with what the Word of God has to say? I'm talking about, are there impure desires? Are there impure motives? Are there impure ambitions? If they're in our hearts, they will work themselves out into our lives. Slowly, but surely. An immaterial world that is not unrelated to the world in which you and I live in. And these people felt like that God did not know. They felt like that it was concealed in darkness. They felt like that it was just in the, it's in the chamber of my imagination. And so nobody knows. But you go on down and they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord seeth us not. For the Lord hath forsaken the earth. They felt like that God didn't know. God didn't, he, he, he wasn't aware of what was going on. Under darkness, they felt like that God was unaware of the hypocrisy of their lives. Under this this chamber of darkness, in this, this room of imagination and desire for that which was evil, they felt like that God didn't know. But I want you to understand something tonight. God knew. And God knows what's going on in your heart tonight. I don't know. You can't, I, you can fool me. I don't know. I, I, all I know is that I can look at the response. I can look at the lives of people. And sometimes it alarms me. Sometimes it stirs my soul. It drives me to prayer for those that, that, that I feel like within my spirit that, that something in their life is amiss. It, 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 I can, all I can do is observe the life. But God observes the heart. God observes the heart. And He knows what's in the heart. You say, how do you know that God was aware of what was going on? Because what we are reading here in Ezekiel chapter 8 is a reality. But it is a spiritual reality. Follow me through. Ezekiel sees all this, but he's seeing a vision. He's seeing a vision of what is taking place within the lives. Ezekiel didn't visit the chamber of imagination in all these people's hearts. It's impossible. It's an immaterial world. It's a place you cannot go physically. You can only go there in in, in your desires and in your ambitions and your goals and, and your thought. You can only go there in your thought life. That's the only way you can get there. And so God took Ezekiel and through a a vision of digging through a wall and entering into a room and seeing the faces of the leaders of Israel and watching them as they were uh, worshiping idols of Egypt. He was revealing to Ezekiel, I know what's going on in the hearts of this people. 
And listen to me tonight. God knows what's going on in your heart and in your life. He knows every desire. He knows every thought. He knows every motive. He knows every ambition. He knows whether it's pleasing to Him. He knows whether it's pure. He judges the hearts. You see, these people didn't know it, but there was an omniscient observer looking down into their hearts and everything they did, every idol they worshipped, every knee they bowed before a false god, there was an omniscient observer that was watching their lives. Yes, his heart was broken. Yes, his heart cried out to them. Yes, he desired that they would turn and go in the right direction. But he was watching. He was aware. He was observant. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro in the earth. He's watching tonight. He sees the desires and the intents of our heart. He can see inside that imagination. He can see inside those chambers of imagery within your life tonight. A couple scriptures. Let me just read these to you. Man looketh on the outward appearance. God looketh on the heart. A lot of people have misunderstood that scripture. But my, how, how grandly it applies to what we're looking at tonight. The people of Israel looked at these 70 men. And what did they see? They saw leaders. But when God looked at these men, what did he see? He saw idolaters. Man looketh on the outward appearance. God looketh on the heart. First Chronicles, the scripture is there. It says this. The Lord searcheth all hearts. Think about that tonight. The Lord searcheth all hearts. And understand, listen to this, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. First Chronicles. The Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. There is an observer tonight. It's not your pastor. It's not your companion. It's someone that knows you far better than either one of those. He's an omniscient God. He's an all-knowing God. He's an all-understanding God. He's an all-aware God. Oh, God, help me tonight. He's one that knows the very thoughts the imaginations, the desires, the intents of our heart. And He's searching us tonight. He's searching our hearts. He's weighing our hearts within His hand. He knows. He knows. The laws of men have no jurisdiction over this world within us. The laws of men have no jurisdiction over this world. You see, I can commit a murder in my heart and the law can't do anything to me for that, can they? I can hate in my heart and the law can't do anything to me for that. You can steal in your heart, but the law can't do anything to you for that. Can you? But you see, there is a higher law. You see, there is a more effective law. You see, there is a more pinpoint law. There's a law that gets down. It's the law of God. It's the law of God that, that comes and it searches out our hearts. He knows us. Listen to this. The Lord desirest truth in the inward parts. <coughs> the Lord desirest truth in the inward parts. Listen. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. God desires truth. God desires sincerity. God desires that we live righteously where? Within our hearts. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's searching for. God comes to each and every one of our hearts tonight. And he judges the chambers of imagery in your life. Not by what he's heard somebody say. 
But he comes and he judges by the sight of his eyes. He beholds the good and the evil. Amen. So there was a world within, there was an omniscient observer, one that was watching out. But I want us to note, we're going to go on into the book of Ezekiel just a little bit here. Let me just kind of give you a rough overview. Would that be okay? In the chapter 8, we see that the chambers of imagery are exposed by God. God reveals, hey, I know what's going on. In the hearts of the leaders, I know. In chapter 8, the chambers of imagery are exposed by God. In chapter 9, the judgment, listen to this, the judgment of God begins on the people of God. You can read chapter 9. It's it's only 11 verses long in the chapter. But the angels of God, they they call them the the men of the city. Those that were in charge. They were were six men. The scripture seems to imply to us that these were the angels of God. They went and they marked the forehead of those who were doing rightly. They went and marked the forehead of the righteous. And God sent out his his, uh, ambassadors. And they destroyed everyone that did not have the mark upon their forehead. This has nothing to do with 666 of of the mark of the beast or anything like that. But I want to note something that's found in chapter 9. And that is that judgment began at the house of God. When God sent his judgment into the nation of, of, of Israel, to the city of Jerusalem, he started in the temple. He started with those that were the nearest to him and he judged them. It doesn't matter where we are, what we know, or, or what, what, what uh, a heritage we have. What matters is, what is the condition of my heart? Is there truth in the inward parts? Is there purity within the inward parts? Is there righteousness in the inward parts? Do I go through the motions of righteousness and my heart is full of dead men's bones? Do I go through the ritual of righteousness and do I live a life that is impure within my heart? It begins at the house of God. And so chapter 9, the judgment of God begins upon the people of God, sparing only a remnant of the people. And then if you look at chapter 10, a very troubling chapter in the book of Ezekiel. You see the glory of God as it rises off of the temple and then it lifts up away from the city of Jerusalem and the glory of God departs from the city, from the house of God. All the while there are 70 elders of the city their hearts are filled with vain imagination their hearts are filled with idolatry their hearts are filled with wickedness and they do not know that the glory of God has departed do you want the glory of God to depart from your life Do you want God to remove his glory? Does God do that? Yes, he does. If we go on in our own willful way, if we go on following after the the desires of our heart, if we go on seeking after our own ways, following after, as it mentions, in I think it's in chapter number 12, heart idols, idols of the heart. If we go on pursuing after these idols of the heart, the glory of God will lift from our life. And much as it was in the case of Samson, as he lay there in the lap of Delilah, unaware of what was going on spiritually in his life, that as the scissor cut the hair, the locks of hair from his head, the glory of God was lifting from his life. And, and, the, the, and Delilah said, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And he rose, he shook himself self, as he did at other times, and wished not that the Spirit of God had departed what can happen so caught up in a world of wickedness in our hearts that God's glory departs and we didn't even know it and when we find out 
in many regards, it's too late, isn't it? Let me tell you something here. I'm coming to a close. There is not a distinction between the world of imagination and the heart and my experience with God. I'm not talking to you tonight, and I've said this already, but I'm not talking to you tonight about an unrelated world. If we have a heart that is after evil, if we have a heart that is not right before God, you say, but I've given my heart to the Lord. I gave my life to the Lord. But are we pursuing his desires? Is my heart after God? David had given his heart to God. But what was in his heart? There was adultery. There was murder. There was scheming. There were evil desires. Yes, the scripture says that David was a man after God's own heart. But look at the heartache. Look at the destruction. That one moment of evil brought into his life. When he looked upon Bathsheba, she bathed. His imagination went wild. And he fulfilled the desires of his imagination. And it destroyed many areas of his life. Look at his family. He sowed to the wind and he reaped the whirlwind. He found repentance. But he did not find hope for his children. Listen to me. The ways of our heart, the desires, the tendencies of our heart affect the direction of my life and my relationship with Jesus Christ. Either to the good or to the evil either to the glory of God abiding upon my life or the glory of God departing from my life. Let me close by giving you a couple scriptures tonight in the way of an admonition. The scripture says, put ye on the hidden man of the heart. But I think, first of all, we should take this scripture. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What is the Word of God telling us there? He's telling us that we make God the God of our heart too. Don't let just God don't don't just let God rule in certain areas of your life, but let Him into the chambers of imagery. Let Him in that world, let Him rule in that world of imagination and desire within your heart. Let him sanctify that world so that every desire, so that every ambition, every motive would be pleasing and glorifying to God. And then put ye on the hidden man of the heart. I think you know me well enough to know that I feel like <clears throat> that real sanctification, that real holiness unto the Lord does not begin with how I look on the outside. Did I discredit how I look on the outside? No, I did not. But the Pharisees look good but they had no substance. These leaders of Israel looked good, but they had no substance. I want to have both. Is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with sanctifying both spirit, soul, and body? Paul admonished the church in Thessalonica to do that. I pray God that your whole spirit soul, body, be sanctified. Tonight, I want us to take a look at our hearts. 
go to that little world within your own heart that you and God know about alone. And say, Lord, I want to sanctify you. I want you to I want to set you up. Not just the God of every other area of my life, but I want to set you up as the God of my desires, my thoughts, my motives, my ambitions, my imagination. Amen. Will you do that tonight? Will you do that tonight? If you're not willing to do that tonight, I'm troubled for your soul. I'm troubled for your future. I'm troubled for the glory of God could depart from your life. And what greater loss could we experience? Can we stand together tonight? Hallelujah. Father, speak to us tonight. Let the Holy Spirit come to the hearts of each and every one of us. We can no longer play games with God. We can no longer straddle the fence. We cannot have a foot in our own desires and a foot in the kingdom of God. We have to be sold out one way or another. Heart, soul, mind, spirit, body, dedicated to the glory of God. Lord, speak to us tonight. I pray that your Holy Ghost would come by and knock on the door of each one of our hearts tonight. And I trust that each one of us here this evening will be willing to open up the chambers of our imagination that were in the allow you to come in and sanctify you, to cleanse, to be glorified in our hearts in Jesus. no way <clears throat> no way that I can know Ezekiel would never have known had it not been for the omniscience and the power of God revealing it to him Ezekiel would have never known but it doesn't matter whether Ezekiel knows or not God knows it doesn't matter whether the preacher knows or not God knows it doesn't matter whether your companion knows or not. God knows. His eyes are searching, running to and fro, and they know our hearts. I say, Lord, sanctify my heart. I want you to be sanctified and rule and reign in my heart. Is that your desire tonight? I'm going to open the altars. And I'm going to ask you to come. I don't want you to come up here and play around. I don't want you to come up here and Forget all about what we've said tonight or what the scripture has to say to us, but I want us to come sincerely and deal with an issue of our hearts. Could we come tonight and find a place of prayer right here in these altars? Ask God, open up your heart to God. Open up your heart to God. <laughs>